Well, welcome to this special Good Friday edition of the 700 Club. Today, Christians everywhere remember the sacrifice for our sins that Jesus made on the cross. During the Easter season, the city of Jerusalem is usually filled with Christians from around the world. This year, there are far fewer visitors, as Paul Strand reports. This is the garden tomb in Jerusalem. Many people believe Christ rose from that tomb, or one much like it. And from that resurrection comes the ability for every person to find and be united with a very living God. Most years around Easter, the garden tomb is filled with Christians coming from around the world to rejoice and worship God. However, due to October 7th and the ongoing war against Hamas, garden tomb director Simon Holland expects far fewer visitors. We're just seeing very small numbers of people come here at the moment. And there's a great fear, I think, in people in just knowing there's a conflict and war. These times of suffering, death and destruction can also lead to doubt about God's existence. That's certainly not the case for Georgian and Winnie Banoff, whose ministry brings joyful worship to some of the world's hardest hit places. Why do that? Because they believe only God can fill people with true joy and peace, especially in tough times. He is life, resurrection, joy, hope, peace, love. How can we live without that, especially in this time? The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength, and only the Lord can pour that strength into us like he did when Georgian met God. Unstoppable joy came. He filled me with the Spirit. Christ came inside him. God will actually will go inside you if, if you ask. That Holy Spirit fell on the disciples soon after Christ's death and resurrection. It gave them great power to reach millions and overcome persecution that threatened to snuff out Christianity. The early church had their share of you know, hard times, but my goodness that the, the Spirit of Christ is uh, no one can conquer that spirit. And when he makes his home in you, you, you can't be conquered. Winnie points out the Holy Spirit still lives today, ready to give believers everything they need to rejoice, even when times are really tough. The spirit of the living God is the only one that can really sustain us through hard times, through persecutions, uh, e even through martyrdom. Saints die, the glory shows up. The, 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 the Lord appears stronger than ever. Georgian says people shouldn't blame God for happenings like the Holocaust or October 7th. The devil exists and uses evil to fight back against God's goodness. Resistance, of course, because Adam turned this earth to the devil. So every day we're taken away from the devil, his authority, his, authority, his property. He doesn't like it, so he's fighting every inch. Simon points out Christ died on the cross to undo the devil's evil. It's where Jesus enters into all that tension, to that pain, where he's reaching into the brokenness of the world and holding it with love. Um, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so we find God at the very heart of suffering, of death, of pain, of cruelty, of injustice. The Bible says the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but God comes to give life and life more abundantly. And there's no place that we can go now where God has not been to come and find us, even when that is in the depths of despair. Georgian and Winnie believe everyone can know this Lord. If they wonder, is there God? Say, God, can you help me believe? Just, if you're real, show up. That's how I said it. God, if you're real, show, show me right now. And he did. Just ask God, do you exist? Do you want to be a friend with me? He will answer. He will show himself to those who seek him. And he will give them the love, peace, and joy that can conquer any circumstance and help them rejoice in even the hardest times. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Garden Tomb, Jerusalem. Well, this is why we celebrate Good Friday. It's the day where Jesus gave himself. He offered his soul as a sacrifice for sin. He fulfilled what the prophet Isaiah wrote centuries before his death. Uh, and you can read it yourself in Isaiah chapter 53. But follow what Winnie and, and, and Georgian said. You can pray that same prayer. This Good Friday, if, you, if you're wondering, is Jesus real? It, it, did he really rise from the dead? Can he really be my savior? Can he really be my Messiah? Well, you can ask for it. It's one of the great, great things we get to do. It's the best news anyone has ever heard that God wants to be Emmanuel. 
He wants to be God with you, in you, above you, below you, in front of you, behind you, to your right, to your left. He wants to totally immerse you in him. It's wonderful. All you have to do is ask for it. So pray that prayer today. Pray, Jesus, if you're there, if you really are my Savior, if you can really forgive me of all the things that I've done wrong, could you show up? Could you show up for me? And if you pray that with all of your heart, he'll answer it. He'll come to you and he'll fill you just as he filled me and just as he filled Winnie and just as he filled Georgia and just as he's filled countless numbers of people for 2,000 years. The best news, he wants to. He loves you so much. He wants to do this for you. So ask him and you can receive. Thanks, Gordon. As we approach Easter Sunday, Christians around the world will reflect on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Despite the recent tensions in Israel, an historic site that's central to the sacrifice and hope of the Christian faith is open to pilgrims. CBN News contributor Chuck Holton takes us to the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem. This is the Garden Tomb in East Jerusalem, which is the Arab quarter of Jerusalem, just outside the city walls. And it is one of the two places that is thought to be the final resting place of Jesus of Nazareth. There are tombs here that match the biblical narrative. It is outside the city walls and is very close to a cliff face that they think could have been the site called Golgotha. Now they closed the garden tomb after the attacks on October 7th because it exists in Arab East Jerusalem and with tensions being so high, they thought it would be safer just to close it for a while, but they reopened it in February. And when people come here, there's one thing that they really wanna see and that's the tomb itself. We said, no, we need to be open because the gospel must be proclaimed, particularly this time. So on February the 4th, we reopened the garden. It would be a real shame to come to a place like this and to just appreciate it for its beauty or its historical significance without taking some time to just sit and contemplate the sacrifice that was made for you and me by Christ on the cross. And the most important part of that story happened right here. I think this is the most important time to have that celebration because we worship a wounded, risen Christ who identifies and shares in our sufferings, but also gives hope. Really, the most important aspect of this place is not what you find here, but what you don't find here, and that is a body. The tomb is empty. Christians from around the world will gather at the Garden Tomb for a sunrise service Easter morning. You can watch the event live at 11.30 p.m. Eastern on Saturday on the CBN News Channel YouTube and the CBN News app. On Easter Sunday, the service will be shown again on the CBN News Channel at the times listed on your screen. Reports that nearly half the world's migratory species are vanishing has some scientists concerned about mass extinction. That has Christian conservationists calling on pastors to preach preservation from the pulpit. CBN's Brody Carter reports. The Bible has so much to say about how important God's creation is to God. And if, and if we're going to love God um, and follow him, we need to love the things that, that he loves. Christian conservationist Dr. Bob Sluka has been raising a red flag regarding nature for years. The recent UN State of the World's Migratory Species Report backed up that alarm, finding roughly 44% of them worldwide are declining in population. And so things like corals are in decline, amphibians, you know, frogs and toads. I mean, just even think about all the insects. There's been talk about the in insect apocalypse that just the crash in numbers of insects. Against the backdrop of this grim news, some migratory animals act as a beacon of hope. So exciting. 
a humpback whale reaching the surface. So exciting and an amazing testament of what can happen when we hear of the earth and everything in it. These migratory animals have been able to rebound population prior to the era of commercial whaling. Beth Porterhouse with the Virginia Beach Aquarium and Marine Science Center believes effective conservation, though, begins with people, not policy. Very simple things like, you know, don't release balloons, um, reduce plastic consumption as much as possible, and look for opportunities in their everyday life to think of themselves as part of the whole community of life. Despite their rebound, a surge in beached whales along the East Coast, juvenile humpbacks identified with entanglement scars. Four whales died within a one-week period. Experts are concerned, saying whales are a sign of the overall health of the ocean. Every other breath basically comes from the ocean. The whales that support that ecosystem, they're kind of the farmers of the whole ocean by moving nutrients through the water column. Porterhouse and Dr. Sluka agree that it's a somber reminder that our activities impact the land, the ocean, and our non-human neighbors that live there. When's the last time you've heard a sermon on creation care in, in a church, or if ever? <laughs> There's a challenge to those pastors out there, you know? It's not political, it's biblical, and you got to preach it. Reporting in Virginia Beach, Virginia, Brody Carter, CBN News. The passion of the Christ. The violence is so brutal, it's hard to fathom. In this next segment, Andrew Knox takes a close look at Jesus' crucifixion and the good news that followed it for believers everywhere. By the time the iron nail, which was about seven inches long, was driven into his wrist, Jesus had already carried the near 100-pound crossbar hundreds of yards, and he'd been savagely beaten, flesh torn from his body, even before his agonizing walk began, just as Isaiah had prophesied. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. The soldiers of the governor had made sure to take the time to humiliate him when they'd had Jesus all to themselves. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. Now atop the hill, it's doubtful Jesus saw the hammer being raised high above his head through his swollen, blood-soaked eyes. Still, it came down with ferocious venom pounding through his flesh. By this time, the Romans had perfected crucifixion. Like a demented surgeon, the Roman warrior felt for space between the bones of the forearm, the precise spot that would not sever arteries. He must be exact, as the location of this nail must support the weight of Jesus without tearing apart his flesh. I wonder, could Jesus hear the clang of the hammer and nail above screaming jeers and taunts of a hateful crowd, or over the sobbing of those who dared still follow him? As one soldier hammers, another prepares the feet of Jesus for a similar fate, while yet a third laughs, only to spit in his face. The soldier's saliva crawls down the side of Christ's cheek, quickly swallowed up by pools of blood Collecting beneath the crossbar, Jesus is now stretched out upon. Listen carefully now. The sounds are haunting. Too exhausted to scream, our Savior groans weakly. When he can muster enough courage, he breathes deeply. Each breath brings excruciating pain. The steady rhythm of his blood drips to the ground. This prepares the landscape for violent tremors soon to come. The clang of the iron nail driven into his other wrist cues the sun that it's almost time to disappear, hide from view and be replaced with the eerie substitute of darkness. 
They lift him now. A new torture begins as his cross slowly rises and slams into the ground into an erect position. His crown of thorns digs deeper into flesh and skull. With the exception of a few taunts, it grows quieter. Jesus opens an eye just wide enough to see soldiers gamble for his garments, just as David penned a thousand years before. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Days before, desperate people reached through crowds simply to touch his clothes and seek the miraculous. Now those clothes are just prizes to be won. The divine nature of Jesus is heard in his prayer, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the human nature of Jesus is heard in his lament, I'm thirsty. The smell of wine vinegar emanates from a jug beneath the cross, and a soaked sponge is lifted to his lips. After committing his spirit to his Father, Jesus declares, it is finished. The sound of thunder moves in while the sun disappears. Down the mountain and across the road, a Roman soldier collecting the instruments of torture they'd used on Jesus hours before is alarmed by the sudden darkness over the mountain above. Then he hears it as the thunder briefly ceases. The curtain of the temple torn in two from top to bottom and the earth beneath him splits open. The smell of death rests on the mountain. The body on the cross is still. There is no movement now. Just a continual streaming of blood. Drip by drip, the blood of Christ falls and splatters on the ground. Each drop carrying the assurance that he loves us beyond measure. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that God made Jesus who knew no sin be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is why the crucifixion matters. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is life-changing news. Yet the brutal death and sacrifice of Christ is not the end of the story. There's greater things in store, and it's just a few days away. This Good Friday, join the saints through the centuries who have meditated on the wounds of Christ and what Jesus did so that you and I could walk free from the law of sin and death. If you want to take this journey, I encourage you to read Psalm 22, the verses that Andrew just mentioned from uh, the last part of Isaiah chapter 52 and all of uh, uh, chapter 53. It's called the, the sin-bearing servant prophecy and how Jesus, it was prophesied that he would suffer, that he would be rejected, that he would be wounded, that his hands and his feet would be pierced, that he would thirst, that he would be marred beyond recognition, that he would take all of the diseases for all people for all time, that he would take all of the sin for all people for all time. And it's all fulfilled in one person, his name Jesus. Now there's a verse in Isaiah 53 that I want you to really pay attention to. When he offers his soul as a sacrifice for sin, he shall see his descendants and his soul will be satisfied. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus, as he's giving his soul as a sacrifice for you, saw you. And in that vision, he was satisfied. This is why the writer of Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. It's a wonderful thing to know that as he's doing this, as he's giving his very essence for you. He saw you. And in that, his soul 
was satisfied. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't have this wonderful relationship, I said it before, I'll say it right now, it's for you. You can be a whosoever. For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus, that whosoever, that's you, you can be a whosoever, would believe on him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. What great love he de demonstrated that while you, while we were sinners, while I was a sinner, he loved me so much that he gave himself for me. And he said, I'll take all the punishment. I'll take all, the, all of the sin. I'll take it all so that I don't have to bear it, so that you don't have to bear it. And as he's doing this, he's seeing it. So if you want this, if you want this relationship where you can see him back, you can know that he's there, that wonderful prayer, Jesus, if you're there, if you really are my Savior, if you can really come and forgive me, if you can really be with me, if you really can be God in me, with me, on this journey together, if, if all of this is real, could you show me? Could you show up for me? If you pray that with all of your heart, he'll answer it. He'll come to you right now, not some far off time. He'll come right now and he'll show up for you. If you want help with your, this prayer, we're here for you. All you gotta do is call us, 1-800-707-000. All you have to say is, I hear I can meet Jesus today. I hear I can have this relationship. I can actually know that he's here. If you, uh, that's all you gotta say, I, can you pray with me? Can you show me? I wanna meet him, I wanna know him. Call us, 1-800-707-000. Terry, over to you. Timu struggled to practice the Muslim daily prayer. He thought it was too hard. Then one day, Timu prayed a very different prayer after watching an episode of Superbook called He is Risen. 11-year-old Timu was confused by his parents' two religions. My dad was Muslim and my mom was Christian. At one point, he said he tried to practice Islam. My dad told me I have to practice the Muslim daily prayer. But it was hard for me because I didn't know how to do it. One day he accepted an invitation to visit an after-school program supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. There he received snacks and free tutoring. He also learned about the Bible from CBN's Superbook. The first story I watched was about David fighting Goliath. I liked when David stood bravely and was not afraid to fight Goliath. But it was the story of Jesus dying on the cross that finally grabbed his heart. I actually teared up when I saw that part of the story where Jesus got whipped, was carrying the cross, and finally crucified. That day, Timo prayed to become a Christian. I prayed, God, please forgive me for my sins. I also prayed, Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. Timo said he loves sharing Superbook stories with his family and prays that one day they will all go to church together. They love the stories I tell them. I am thankful to Jesus and to the people who gave Superbook to us. Thank you. Isn't it wonderful to know, 700 Club members, that Timu is just one of many, many children. In this situation on the other side of the world that you'll never know here, but you'll know in heaven because he found salvation through your generosity and kindness. Watching Superbook, hearing about the love of God, being surrounded by people who love God and have reached out in love to him. That's the kind of thing that 700 Club members are doing around the world every single day, not just with children, with adults, with families, people in need, communities in need, disaster relief scenarios. We want to say thank you. You make all of that possible. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. And we want to encourage those of 
you who haven't joined yet to go to your phone and call us. The number's toll free. It's right there on your screen. 1-800-700-7000. You just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. But look. Here are all the options you have. A general membership is $20 a month, but you might want to join at 700 Club Gold. That's $40 a month. Or the 1,000 Club, that's $84 a month. You can become a 2,500 Club member for $209 a month. Or a founder, that's $5,000 a year. It works out to $417 a month. Do what God is speaking to your heart to do today because you and I really do get to change the world when we are obedient to him and showing our love of Christ to those who don't know him yet. So call now. Listen, when you do, I've got a great thank you for you. This is Gordon's teaching on how to believe for healing. It's our gift to you. It comes with a handbook as well to help instill these principles, biblical principles in your heart and mind. We want to send it to you right away when you join the 700 Club. Be a part of changing the world with us, won't you? Call now. Gordon? Between Easter egg hunts, bunnies, and baskets, the real meaning of Christ's resurrection can actually get lost. And that's why Terry brought her granddaughter Izzy to the studio to demonstrate a fun way to teach children the true significance of Easter. Hi, I'm Terry, and I'm here with my granddaughter, Izzy. And Easter is a really special time in our house and we're a family. You know, we decorate with things like eggs and bunnies around the house, but we don't do it because of the Easter bunny. We do it because they all represent new life. And the new life is the really important part of Easter, to remember what Jesus did for us, right? When you think of Easter, what do you think of? I think that God is really the light of the world. I'll take that. Thank you. <laughs> that was unrehearsed. <laughs> it's my girl. Well, Izzy and I thought it would be fun to show you how to make cake pops. This is a fun thing you can do to celebrate Easter. And you can do it with your, you can do it yourself or you can do it with the children in your family. But we enjoy eating cake pops, right? And where do we usually do that? Um, at Starbucks. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> An honest word. Well, in order to make this, I want to tell you a few of the ingredients you're going to need. You'll need a yellow cake mix. You'll need some vanilla frosting, some white chocolate. Oh, we have been munching on these all day. Um, two to three containers of sprinkles. Izzy and I like the Easter colors, but you can do whatever you want for your decorations. And some coconut oil. And then these are the, the equipment pieces you're going to need. A pan, some large bowls, a mixer lollipop sticks, water to get the chocolate off your teeth, ice trays, <laughs> and some utensils. And one thing I highly recommend is a styrofoam box because this is where you're going to place your cake pops to dry after you start putting them together. So the first step is to make your cake. Now, due to the magic of television, we already have a cake that's been made, right? Mm -hmm. So Izzy, I'm going to put this right here in front of you. Move these things over, and I'm going to take this little bowl off the bowl, because you know what we're going to do? Okay. I'm going to reach right over you. We're going to cut this much of this cake for right now. And then, we, the part of the fun of this is, we get to do, yep, we get to, well, not in your mouth, honey, it's going in this bowl. <laughs> so just pick it up, tear off a piece, and we're just going to crumble it in this bowl, because the mixer is going to help us really blend it a little bit more, so crumble it. We're gonna take this bowl full, you can wipe your hands on that apron. <laughs> we're gonna take this bowl full of crumbled cake, we're gonna put it in here, lock it into our mixer, hang on a second, okay, put it on, just a low, low level, because all we're really trying to do is to get the mixer to more <laughs> safely, that's it, yeah, we can put it down, to, let's do three, there we go. Okay, and you know what I have here? Frosting, sometimes we eat this right out of the container at home, but we're gonna put it in here right now. Ooh, doesn't that look good? And then do you, I'm gonna put this down, and can you turn that on again? Just do it on like the low, the low setting. And we want that frosting to mix in with all of the bread pieces. So while that is mixing together, let's take our white chocolate, and add the coconut oil, that's right. And then we're gonna microwave it. And I am gonna clean this off. And I'll bring it over here. I'm gonna work on our next part of this. Okay, let's check that, because it should be it should be done by now. Yeah, oh yeah. Yep. Is that not? Nope, just more. 
Okay, bring it over here. Now, let, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put this in this bowl. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> and now, we're gonna make up, make the balls that go in this little form. You wanna do one? We'll do, let's do three of them, okay? So take about that much. You will roll it. You need more than that. You have little hands. <laughs> I have cake pop size hands. <laughs> there you go. Because see the base of that? Yeah. This has to fit in there. Okay, mine might be, mine might be a little big. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> okay, now you're probably wondering, why did we melt this chocolate? Well, you have to actually anchor the stick in these. Do you want to grab one of the sticks we have here? I'm going to move this out of the way. Dip it in the chocolate. Yeah. I mean, really dip it, like, mm. Okay, do you have it on there? Now twirl it. Now stick it in, but not all the way through, just into the middle. Can you do that? Perfect. Down enough to hold it. That girl. Okay, take another one. We'll each do one. So twirl the chocolate stick. Don't let it drip off. Yeah. Stick it in. And then, good job. What we have to do is put this in the refrigerator for two to eight hours, or you can freeze it if you want to. So we're gonna go back and take something out of the freezer that's already been done and put this one in. You wanna get the big one? Oops, careful, you're gonna have to, there you go. The really fun part of this, of course, is the decorating. We've got our large bowl of white chocolate melted with a couple of teaspoons of coconut oil for this next part. And you need to move fast because the oil will keep the chocolate from seizing, but it happens quickly. So take one. Should we dip it? And you might have to like twist it. Like after you dip it, like lift up and whoa, yeah. Ooh, mama, Sita. That looks good, doesn't it? Okay, we'll wait. Drip, let it drip. Let it drip, let it drip, twist. Okay, now I'm gonna hold this and you decorate. Oh, oh well, this can be a little messy, but it's fun. Okay, go ahead, spring. Oh, that's beautiful, Is That looks great. How about the top of that? One a little more? Okay, so now we're gonna set this one in a new, there we go. Can you push a little, oh, just saying. Never waste frosting. That's my motto. So, by the magic of television again, I want to show you a platter of finished product. Take a look at what it looks like when they're finished. There they are. And now, for my favorite part, Izzy, that's yours. This is mine. You ready? Delicious, delicious. What do you think? Happy Easter. We hope you enjoy making this fun recipe. Most of all, we hope your Easter's filled with the joy of the real story of Easter, the salvation we have in Jesus. Happy hope, have a happy Easter. Uh, you can find more recipes and special features in our Easter segment on the CBN Family app. You can check them out there, or you can go to cbnfamily.com. Uh, I think I need to ha have a whole new family tradition of cake pops. Yeah. Um, you know, they really are good. But beyond that, it's just fun to do things with your kids and your grandkids. And your little grandkids are going to be coming up pretty soon. And yeah. there you'll be with I'm, your I'm apron on in the kitchen. I'm soon. <laughs> it'll probably be after he's... Yeah, that's our, our tradition was to do uh, both on Christmas morning and on Easter to do a souffle. On oh. Easter, we get to have the joke, he is risen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when Amen. your souffle yes. rises, souffle he rises. is risen I indeed. Like so, I like that, I like that, yes, that should be the response, of course. Brittany Gilchrist was traveling with her two daughters when their car was struck head on. Angels who witnessed the accident fought through the smoke to get them all out. Almost immediately, a bystander went into fervent prayer for their miraculous survival. June 22, 2011, Madera County, California, a head-on collision involving a 4x4 truck and passenger car stops traffic on Highway 41. Several motorists run to give aid. 
One of them was then 62-year-old Vietnam War vet Bob Anthony, who ran to the car. I thought I found a rock <laughs> broke out the windows uh, because I could see there was people in there. In the back seat were a four-year-old girl and an infant still strapped in a car seat. The driver, 28-year-old Brittany Gilchrist, was pinned under the dashboard, unconscious. Smoke was filling the car. I was yelling at everybody, we got to get him out of here, because when I got a whiff of that smoke, it knocked my feet. I, you know, I didn't want her to die. A couple of men got the children out, while Bob and others pulled Brittany from the wreckage. Seconds later, the car burst into flames. Motorist Brenda Harris was sitting in the gridlock traffic just a few cars away. I could see, you know, in, in the distance, there, you know, the, the fire, and I need to start praying, because that's what I do when I see a wreck. Lord God, I just want to intercede for these people involved in this accident. I, I pray for whoever it is that you, know, you save them, protect them, and give them, give them life. <laughs> when EMS took over, they determined Brittany was bleeding internally, had multiple fractures, and in critical condition. Her daughters, with non-life-threatening injuries, were taken to a nearby hospital. The driver of the truck was uninjured. Meanwhile, Sky Life arrived to take Brittany to Community Regional Medical Center in Fresno. On flight, she coded twice. Brittany's husband Mark arrived about the same time the chopper landed. He saw his wife of five years hooked up to a ventilator before she was taken to emergency surgery. She wasn't really conscious. She was kind of moving a little bit, but she wasn't aware of anything that was going on. Seeing her like that, it really just says, like, oh my gosh, she might die. So it, it was just overwhelming. And then I went, I went back in the room and I just broke down. I think at that moment, I do remember playing and I was just said, please, just please don't take her. Just whatever has to happen, just please don't take her. Brittany would need two surgeries to repair her legs that were broken in several places. Their main concern, though, was the massive neck trauma she sustained and whether she'd broken her spinal cord. But there was so much left uncertain that we, we couldn't be sure of anything. So it was a matter of like, yes, she's out of being in that extremely critical situation where she might die at any moment to then the surgery to then, you know, is her spine in it? Is she gonna walk again? As for their daughters, they had been taken to Valley Children's Hospital Four-year-old Cambria had two broken arms and would stay in the hospital for two months. Five-week-old Shaylin had only a few cuts and was sent home with relatives. Meanwhile, people began to pray for Brittany. Among them was the motorist Brenda, who had never stopped. I didn't know, like, who that person was. I mean, like, at that time. And then two days later, when I went to work, I heard it was Brittany, the nurse I work with. And I put her on prayer. Um, prayer list at our church and I also have a group of friends in Bible study and ask them to pray because she was very close to death. Finally, an MRI confirmed there was no spinal fracture and her neck would heal in time. Still, doctors weren't sure she'd walk again. In and out of consciousness, Brittany was taken off the vent. It was just so hard and I knew deep down, even though I couldn't remember, I knew how severe it was. I knew that we were here for a reason that God spared our lives and actually that's my first like thought or memory not necessarily of like a place but was a feeling was that um, God had us <laughs> that we were alive for a reason and that he was going to take care of us and that's really where that peace you know came from over the course of more than a year Brittany had two more surgeries and continued rehab she finally walked on her own returned to her nursing career and today continues to see healing. There's days that it's rough, you know, where I'll do a few things and then I have to pay for it <laughs> a couple days afterwards, but there's been improvement. The Lord has given strength in it. And then, you know, not every bit has been healed, but he has in chunks, you know, as, as he wills and as he, you know, what he has for us, <laughs> you know, we're like, okay, Lord, whatever you have, your will be done. And he's done that. Bob Anthony and two others were later honored with the American Red Cross Real Hero Award for their efforts. He and the family are grateful God's hands were on them all that day and for the prayers 
that has sustained them. From the grace of God, we were all there and we were, we were able to help. I'm thankful I was there that day too. It was just uh, amazing. I looked back on it and I said, God was there. They said I wouldn't walk again. I wouldn't be a nurse, you know, but although they said the accident was unsurvivable too, so. And we're here, so, you know, with God, all things are possible. God wasn't just there that day. God is with us. You know, he says when we seek for him with all of our hearts, he's there, he's present, he responds, he wants us to know him. There are many of you today who might not be in a car accident like Brittany was or have even such serious uh, casualties that have been a part of your life, but sometimes they are. You know, diseases come upon people, accidents happen. We want to pray with you today for whatever your need is. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's something with your children, uh, your marriage. Who knows? God knows. He knows us. He knows us inside and out. He knows us by name, and He is present. And so we want to take some time to pray for you and with you today. We have some other uh, people who have written in. This is Gabriella. She wrote by email. She said, I was in my car during my 30-minute lunch break watching the 700 Club through my iPhone. Gordon spoke about someone with a varicose vein on the right leg. I had never before felt that a word of knowledge from the 700 Club was for me. But I knew this was for me when Gordon said something like, you have pain and are scared that it might cause problem or injury. Right then, I declared healing. Afterwards, I haven't had any discomfort. Praise the Lord. Here's Warren from Graham, Washington. He took a large vitamin C tablet. Mm. The pill went down the wrong pipe. His right lung started filling with mucus. Asorbic acid burned the top of his lung, windpipe, and the back of his throat. After a week of intense pain, the burning eased up a bit. He was miserable, crackling and wheezing all day and night. Well, Warren and his Pam were watching the 700 Club, and here's Terry praying. This is also a lung issue. You have aspirated some stuff into your lungs more than one time. Now you're having issues with your breathing, with your lungs, and with infection. God is healing that right now as though it never happened. Wow. Well, he and Pam looked at each other, but they did, and claimed the healing. Since then, he quit choking, coughing, can breathe freely again. He's healed and gives all praise to Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Mm. Let that name just be written on your heart right now, that he is our healer. I am the Lord who heals your disease. He is our healer. Now, when did that happen? When, when, when was 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 that evident well it was there from the beginning of time he 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 wanted wanted to heal the all the diseases of the israelites he did he, he kept them disease free he made sure their garments didn't wear out he, he did that for a long period of time but when did it happen for all people for all time when did that happen well it happened on good friday it happened when jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for sin that he carried away all our infirmity. Isn't that wonderful? I like to challenge Christians. If you have the faith to believe that your sins are for forgiven, you have all the faith that you need to believe for healing. Now, that may be a new thought for you, but here's another thought. With God, all things are possible. Isn't that wonderful? All things are possible. So how big is possible for you? How big is God for you? Don't look to your own acts. Don't look to your own prayers. Don't look to how good you are. Or, you know, all the bad things will happen if you're not healed. All, don't look to any of that. Look to the finished work of the cross. Look to Jesus. He is the author and finisher of your faith. Look to him to come to you and heal your disease. Now, here's some scripture. When two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Here's another one. When two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. Let Terry and I be your two or more, and let Jesus do all the rest. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you and we declare that with you all things are possible. We declare that by your sacrifice all of our sins are forgiven all of our diseases are healed. 
we declare the good news. And we ask that you would reach forth your hand to do signs, wonders, and miracles today. May people be healed from the top of their head to the soles of their feet now in Jesus' name. There's someone, uh, you heard the report about uh, aspirated, and you've had, uh, I believe it's stomach acid that's been aspirated, and it's a particular problem in your left lung, and there's searing pain and, and lingering problems from it. God is healing you right now. In the name of Jesus, may that lung tissue be completely restored. May your esophagus be restored. May your vocal cords be restored. May everything concerning you be restored right now in Jesus' name. Terry? There's someone else. You have a, um, a deviated septum, which is not an unusual thing. Lots of people have it, but for you, it it's uh, bigger than that. It affects your whole sinus cavity and infection. God's healing that for you right now. You're not going to need surgery or anything else. Just receive that in Jesus' name. And there's someone else. You're in a hospital setting. This isn't really about you. It's about the person you're praying for. But there's a, um, a breathing issue. There's like this round machine that's like an accordion that goes up and down and it makes a whooshing sound and you are praying for the life and well-being of your loved one. Jesus is right there with you. He's in charge of it all. He's got the life of your loved one in his hands. Just receive that and trust him in Jesus' name. For someone with a right shoulder injury, you're being healed. Someone with the right jaw, you're, all that swelling pain leaving you right now. Someone with uh, enormous pain in your heart, congestion, that affects your heart muscle. God's healing all of it right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've been healed, let us know. Call us 1 800 700 7000. Here's a word from Peter. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. 